an hour ago and asked him what should I present on. And he said, speak of something that's relevant to the now, right? Because I have multiple presentations. So I took a presentation that I haven't presented in a while. And in the last two hours, I've been restructuring it a little bit. And it's basically, it's sound and vibration, quantum physics, quantum metaphysics. So it's breaking down the vibration and frequency and how that connects to metaphysical world and spirituality. But I've actually added a few slides and I'm going to make commentary the whole time in regards to space travel and how beings could possibly um, be visiting Earth using other technology rather than going at, speed, uh, at the speed of light because we know it might take thousands of years for them to get here. Right. Yeah, so it's going to be 50 oh, percent <laughs> freestyle, 50 percent freestyle and then 50 percent guided on the presentations here. So we'll kind of see where we go. I'm so I'm so pumped for this, bro. So pumped. But I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the screen up to you, brother. And I, you know, thank you so much for coming out, man. I apologize for that dot org. I don't know why it went to dot com. Oh, cool. It's dot com forward to dot org. So don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Well, go to dot org, everybody. Portal to Ascension dot org. Sign up. Get on board. You know, Neil is he does the best conferences out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you've been if you haven't heard of it. But it is absolutely like tremendous work. He's always on almost every weekend with a different conference, right, Neil? It's it's just incredible, incredible. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give the floor to you, brother. Do your thing, and I'm excited. Let's get it in. Thank you, Rob. Thanks so much, brother. I'm really excited to be here and part of this community and speaking right now. And Omar, dude, that was amazing. I haven't I haven't fully sat like I sat through a couple of your presentations before, and I listened to some of it, but I sat through most of this one, and that was so epic. So I'll, we'll talk more about your presentation later, but it was great. Okay, everybody. So today's presentation is, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. But before I get into the presentation, I want to make a quick announcement. And if uh, Rob, once I share screen, if you can, actually, I need to make sure my audio is shared as well. Hold on. Once I share screen, if you can make sure it shows up. Absolutely. Okay, share audio. Boom, boom, boom. Let me know if you see my screen. See my screen? Yeah. Do you want to do half half or do you want to full? Uh, the video is already there. You can subscribe. You'll get the notification once we go live. We're live in 21 hours. So check that out right there. All right. Let's do this, guys. So today's presentation is. Sound frequency and the extraterrestrial connection. And to be more specific, it's more about quantum physics and talking about what is going on right now, you know, in the mainstream in regards to the UFO disclosure and how we can tie that into the whole realization that we're subatomic beings and that we live in a quantum world and what our understanding of quantum physics and technology is making us realize is happening when we see these UFO sightings and also when we uh, when we speculate about what we can possibly achieve in the future, right? So this is um, a completely re redone past presentation that was specifically in quantum physics, but now we're taking more of an ET uh, space travel approach to it. So what we're going to cover today is the following. Consciousness, spirituality, extraterrestrials, and more can all be explained scientifically through quantum physics. Religion and science are now merging. Eastern and Western philosophy and medication need to work together to cure all illness. Um, the other two, I kind of shifted. I'm going to pass this slide. I'm going to skip over this slide because I actually shifted this presentation to include more than that's there. So we'll just get into that in a bit. But the reason why I even started doing presentations on sound and vibration is the following. This quote really says it all. And I've done many presentations on sound and frequency, and I almost always started with the following two quotes. This one goes like this. The forms of all the forms of snowflakes and faces of flowers may take on this shape because they respond to some sound in nature. Likewise, it is possible that crystals, plants, and human beings may be in some way music that has taken on visible form. I like this quote because it truly says everything about the fact that we're all vibration and frequency. And just by the realization that we're all vibration and frequency really shifts our perspective on how we can navigate in this reality. And here's another quote by Nikola Tesla. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. 
I've always loved to talk about sound and vibration because it literally is all that is where everything that is physical and non-physical is frequency. So you can almost have a conversation about any topic and include the whole concept of sound and vibration within it. So before we get started into the meat of this presentation, here are some universal ground facts. And these are what we have not only understood spiritually, but we've also understood scientifically now and believe that we have enough evidence to prov prove that this is actually real. So the first one is we are vibratory energy beings. Yes, we're all subatomic beings and we vibrate. Our brains produce electricity. Yes, that's true. You have a, a type of acid in your brain. It forms an electrical current. That electrical current travels down your spine um, to all your organs, and it creates. Um, it basically pumps and fuels your body. Vibration of frequency is measured in hertz. That's how we're measuring it in this day and age. One hertz will be one cycle per second. 100 hertz, 100 times per second. The universe is singing. This is something you might be like, well, how is this proven? Well, we'll get to that slide, those slides later when we show how we have now translated frequencies of celestial bodies into audible tones and what they sound like. Humans have lived on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years, more than widely accepted. In my mind, that's already been proven. I'm not going to get into the proof on that one. Also, all ancient religions and origin stories talk about sound. The universe is definitely full of frequency. We can only hear and see a limited frequency range, meaning that just like we can only hear certain tones, we can also only see certain frequencies. There's a range of frequencies above and below what we can perceive that we're not able to actually see. There's countless inaudible frequencies around us always. This right here is a graph of our brainwave frequency patterns. These are the different types of frequency waves that our brains can have and what they're called. The first one is gamma wave, which is known as the genius brainwave. The second one is the beta wave, which is kind of what we're in right now because we're having a linear analytical, even though we're talking about very right brain concepts as well, we're having an analytical present presentation style, left brain thinking format, which allows us to be in a beta state when your eyes are open. Alpha wave is usually when you have your eyes closed and you're still alert, you're an alpha wave. Theta wave is the deep, is the meditative state, the intuition flashes inspiration. This is a state that people wish to get to in meditative states in order to do the inner healing or even you know travel astrally or do some type of spiritual work. And then delta wave is also an even deeper version of that. And you can also travel astrally within the delta wave, but it's usually known as the deep dreamless sleep state. When I first started getting into um, like all the metaphysical concepts of spirituality, I would hear the term chakra a lot, right? It was just thrown around quite a lot in the spiritual community. I used to think that it was a metaphysical term for an energy center. And I didn't really know if there was any real reality to it. I just knew that we just said that there was these portals in the body, vortices. And then after I started doing research, I found a graph such as this. And to me, it actually proved that the chakra system is actually a reality and it's a scientific reality. So what occurs is your brain produces an electrical current and it goes down your nervous system through your uh, brain stem into your, into your spine and out of your spine to all the corresponding organs. Well, there are actually little areas and holes within the spine, um, in your spine that have an outpour of nerves that go to the corresponding organs. And these, this area is called the neural foramen, right? And this is actually the physical areas for the chakras. So the chakras actually exist. It's the neural foramen, and it's an outpour of nerves. And guess what, where those nerves go to? So it's taking an electrical current from your brain, down your spine, into all these organs. And guess where they go to? They go to the corresponding organs that we know each of those chakra points relate to, completely in alignment with ancient texts. The nerve roots travel to reach the rest of your body, and it takes an electrical current, and without the electrical current going through your body, you would not have a signal in your body to keep yourself alive because you're not dead until you are what? Until you're brain dead, as they say, right? So when you're brain dead, the electrical signal is no longer pumping out of your brain. Therefore, your organs are no longer able to work. All right, so now that we get put that out the way, right there was a very basic um, summary of some universal facts and some um, um, physiology of the human body, scientific uh, physiology of the human body, so we can understand that this is a reality before we jump in deep down the rabbit hole into the quantum world. So here we go, quantum world, extraterrestrials, and space travel. 
firstly, what is quantum physics? Well, quantum mechanics, also known as quantum physics or quantum theory, is a fundamental branch of physics that deals with attempting to define and understand the subatomic world. The, the origin, major contributions being Max Planck's 1900s proposal that energy is made up of smaller units called quanta. And what is metaphysics? Metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, vibration, and space. The origin of this is meta, meaning the word beyond, which refers to the title given to a comp compilation of Aristotle's work on the subject. Because they follow Aristotle's physics, the work together took the name metaphysics. So both of these disciplines are based on the premises of vibration and frequency. Meditation and metaphysics physical practices are designed to harmonize your vibration. Those that have obtained enlightenment right, or spiritual awakening have in essence shifted their vibratory frequency. That's the metaphysics connection. So meta is, is, that, is the basis of all ensuing philosophy. Quantum, however, is a way of attempting to scientifically understand how the universe works. So metaphysics is almost the philosophy behind the subatomic world, and quantum physics is the mathematics behind the subatomic world. But they're both the same thing just looking at it from different angles and with different terms. To me, metaphysics is metaphorical quantum physics because it's the same thing as quantum physics, except we're using a metaphorical term to explain what we can now explain scientifically. And here's an, a graph that I created quite a few years ago to give you kind of an example of that. We have the quantum term, which is singularity. We have the metaphysics term, which is oneness. We have the quantum term, quantum field, metaphysics, consciousness, Quantum term, electromagnetic field, metaphysical term, aura, right? It's the same exact thing. Quantum physics, wave, metaphysics, vibration. Quantum physics, dimension, metaphysics, realm, right? And we even have the paradox there. So these are, if not almost exactly the same, have many, many crossovers in regards to the fact that they're both attempting to explore the same kind of concepts even time and space, right? Quantum physics, bending space-time. Non-locality now, so now a component of quantum physics. The ability of objects to instantaneously know about each other's state, even when separated by large distances, potentially even billions of light years, almost as if the universe at large instantaneously arranges its particles in anticipation of future events. This contradicts Einstein's theory that nothing can go faster than the speed of light since this form of communication is instant, proves what ancient scriptures, spiritual scriptures have been saying. So let's pause here for a second and what, see what this is talking about. So non-locality, the ability, the ability of objects to instantaneously know about each other's state, right? So you could be a billion light years away from me, right? But within one moment, you're able to understand the exact same data as where I'm at. What does this do right here? Just the understanding of that reality existing, what does what are the questions that arise from it, right? So a question would be, well, if we don't need to use light in order, well, first of all, how does it happen, right? How is everything known everywhere? Um, if, if something can be so far away but can understand and know exactly what's going on in this moment somewhere else, does that mean this is all an illusion and it's computer programming, like an organic computer program maybe, where there's data everywhere and from every single point within this construct of this program, we're able to extract data of all that is, you know, some people call it the Akashic Records, and we're able to understand it. But also, how... How does this connect to the non-locality of being able to transport your consciousness from one area to another area? So now we're getting into concepts such as space travel or um, instantaneously manifesting somewhere or even teleportation. How do we send our consciousness from one place to another place without having the limitation of distance? Okay. So as I said, this contradicts Einstein's theory because he did believe that nothing could go faster than the speed of light. But now we're realizing that things can go fast in the speed of light. And quantum computing is a great example of this exactly, actually. Because regular supercomputers, something that it took, it takes a regular supercomputer super around 1,000 years to, um, to basically compute. A quantum computer can do it in a matter of moments. 
right? So what is happening is that instead of having to go through the linear process of computing things over and over and over until we figure something out, there we've now tapped into the ability of understanding information mo in moments that should take forever, including traveling at long distances. Here is the image to, to compare the metaphysic term of aura and the electromagnetic field. So we're all made out of some of subatomic particles. So is our planet Earth. So is our body. So is the table in front of me, the computer. Everything has made of subatomic particles. These are subatomic particles vibrate. These vibrations and subatomic particles create a field of energy around us, just like an atom does, just like a subatomic particle does, just like your human body does, it creates its own electromagnetic field, just like every single planet and celestial body in the universe. As you can see here, here is an image of Earth's electromagnetic field. So we all have these electromagnetic fields and the aura, even though it's been used as a spiritual term, is just basically explaining the fact that we have our own electromagnetic fields and through vibration technology modalities, we're able to shift and expand that. stop that video there but basically showing that uh, earth has an electromagnetic magnetic field and it's also in alignment with harmonics and it beats in rhythm like a drum and just like rob had uh, mentioned earlier how not only is everything connecting to this ancient wisdom of how it becomes part of the earth but it also resonates harmonics and frequency just goes to show how we're also part of the earth and we're also vibration and frequency and then the earth is also adhering to some sort of rhythm within the universe. I read an article uh, on physics.org, physics.org, not too long ago, and it was also saying that it looked like Earth was adhering to some sort of pattern that attracts cataclysmic disasters, okay? Realize what they just said there. Adhering to some sort of pattern that attracts cataclysmic disasters. So, you you know, every 13,000 years, some say that there's the cataclysm on Earth, um, the Hopi said that we've been destroyed the Earth in four different ways, Earth, Wind, Fire, and Water. Now it's the ether phase, um, and it's recycling over and over. And so they're realizing that something is going on in regards to the pattern of the way the Earth is traveling throughout the galaxy that is actually creating and manifesting, literally, um, these type of disasters that are having a recycling reset phase on the Earth. So scientific research has found that the aura is an electromagnetic field of energy that extends around our body around four to five feet. The aura represents your physical, mental, emotional, as well as spiritual energies. Also connects all subtle bodies and acts like a shield protecting the human vessel and absorbing specific energies. So could the alert Earth's electromagnetic field represent its physical, mental, and emotional aura? If the Earth is a sentient being, does it also have an aura? Science and religion have been, you know, we're in the age now where science and religion is, has been separated for quite some time. But I don't like to say religion, let's say spirituality, right? Science and spirituality. In the ancient times, thousands of years ago, it was one and the same. Even, even in the Greek times of Pythagoras, um, they really concentrated on that similarity. But then it continued being the same for thousands of years of devolution into a darker age in humanity. And as it was the same then, it was actually kind of looked as... Um, I'm sorry, and then it was actually separated and everything became dictated by the church and basically religious organizations and all the evidence that was coming out that was showing that the universe could be much more, much different than what we've been told by our religious institutes was kind of either hidden away or the people that brought this information out or persecuted or even killed. 
But now, in this age where we're discovering so much scientifically, there seems to be a merging of ancient spiritual wisdom with physics and, you know, the whole realm of sound and vibration. Science and religion are separate and have been at odds with each other for quite some time. Science in today's world is based on Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics doesn't actually synchronize with quantum physics because in in, in Newtonian physics, well, in subatomic world, in quantum physics, in the subatomic world, particles are acting extremely uh, are, are acting extremely erratically and aren't able to be predicted like they are within the Newtonian world. So subatomic particles act in ways that are confusing us that we can't actually fathom why it's actually happening. Whereas in the Newtonian world, everything follows Newtonian's physics and all the laws that he outlined, right? So, but the thing is that doesn't make sense because the subatomic world is the actual building box for the Newtonian world. If it wasn't for the subatomic world, the Newtonian world would not exist. So how is it that the subatomic physics doesn't match up with the Newtonian physics if it's the building blocks for that, right? So that's where the paradox is, and that's what has confused many people along this journey of awakening to the subatomic world. So to me, this actually symbolizes that this is kind of an illusion, right? Like we've pierced through the veil here. The only thing that exists are frequencies, and our perception is the dream or a very advanced virtual reality, which then goes into, if that is the case, what forms of space travel are we able to cultivate and also also the beings that are visiting us are able to do, right? Whether they're here on the planet, whether they're traveling interdimensionally or extraterrestrial from another planet, what are the types of technologies that are being utilized to get here? Because obviously, as, spec as um, spoke about right before I got into this presentation, that if we have the limitation of the speed of light, it would take civilization so many years in order to get here and might not be worth the while to do that. But if they were able to travel through wormholes, um, travel through wormholes or bend space time somehow, or have some other type of advanced um, understanding of the subatomic world, even by locate and or non-locality non and then move from one place to another place instantaneously, right? Like in, for example, the spore drive in the Star Trek Discovery, which is the new Star Trek that just came out, well, it came out a couple of years ago, but it's really awesome. They have this spore drive that connects to the mycelium network, which is the mushroom fungi network of the whole entire universe that uses um, the fungi in order to transfer the whole entire um, the whole entire spacecraft to another part in the universe just instantaneously rather than having to go through subspace. And it's very interesting because we have recently discovered that there's a huge mycelium network of spores all over the universe and it seems to travel from planet to planet and it's even speculated that um that basically spores from mycelium could actually be what travels all over the universe and brings life to other planets so researchers at the wiseman institute of science have conducted an experiment demonstrating how a beam of electrons is affected by the act of being observed the experiment revealed that the greater um, the amount of watching, the greater the observer's influence on what actually takes place. A position of a particle at the quantum state cannot be determined unless a measurement, which is an observation of its position, is made. So the very act of watching something within the subatomic experiments affects the reality, that it acts differently upon being observed. The very act of watching the observer affects the observed reality. What does that mean, right? So if we are not looking at it, it will behave one way. If we're looking at it, it will behave another way, right? What does that mean for humanity? Well, again, it looks like we've just pierced through some sort of illusion, some sort of veil that even though on the Newtonian world, on the atomic world, that we can see everything as physical and, and consistent, the building blocks of what it's made out of are only acting upon observation, right? And this ties into like, not to go deep into explanation here, but this is kind of like a Truman Show um, realization over here that by setting our intent and observation, reality manifests. And without intent and observation, it's just frequency. When being observed, the electrons would bounce off the barrier. When not observed, the electrons would act as waves and make it through the barrier, acting as a wave and as a particle at the exact same time. When not observed, the electron would exist in two locations simultaneously, right? So a lot of different things going on there, and all this is 
is us realizing the theories of a technology that we don't quite understand yet, but we're seeing occur when we have this whole UFO um, sighting situation going on around the world, right? So let's talk about the whole ATIP program for a second. 2004 to whenever they closed it down, I think it was 2017 or something like that. They had all these cases within the um, the UAP report, um, around 144 cases. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the the UFO report that was that just came out this past month that was asked to be released um, in the COVID relief bill that I think took place in November of last year that they asked for the UFOs, the AT program to basically release all the information that they had in regards to this. There were two documents released. One was given to the Congress for the public, and that was for us, right? It was just a, a, less than 10 pieces of paper. And then there was a more in-depth one that was given to Congress that was classified. And in there, it was saying that these, um, and not only in there, but also other people that have come out and spoke about this that work for the program, have said that these craft were acting in a way that we know, that we think is impossible, but we know isn't po is possible because we've been observing it through our um, experiments of quantum physics. So we've been experimenting the quantum physics and we've been seeing all of these amazing things happen. And now all of a sudden there are all these sightings that are doing the things that we are only theorizing is possible. That is what is the conventional thing right there. So when you see all these craft, it's not like, oh, they're doing something impossible. It's like, oh, they're doing something that we're actually realizing to talk about sound and vibration because it literally is all that is where everything that is physical and non-physical is frequency. So you can almost have a conversation about any topic and include the whole concept of sound and vibration within it. So before we get started into the meat of this presentation, here are some universal ground facts. And these are what we have not only understood spiritually, but we've also understood scientifically now and believe that we have enough evidence to prov prove that this is actually real. So the first one is we are vibratory energy beings. But at the same time, I would say we also both. And that leads out. We've actually been able to manifest in the subatomic world. And now, in order to do it on a large scale, reveal that the greater um, the amount of watching, the greater the observer's influence on what actually takes place. A position of a particle at the quantum state cannot be determined unless a measurement, which is an observation of its position, is made. So the very act of watching something within these subatomic experiments affects the reality, that it acts differently upon being observed. The very act of watching the observer affects the observed reality. What does that mean, right? So if we are not looking at it, it will behave one way. If we're looking at it, it will behave another way, right? What does that mean for humanity? Well, again, it looks like we've just pierced through some sort of illusion, some sort of veil that even though on the Newtonian world, on the atomic world, that we can see everything as physical and and consistent, the building blocks of what it's made out of are only acting upon observation, right? And this ties into like, not to go deep into explanation here, but this is kind of like a Truman Show um, realization over here that by setting our intent and observation, reality manifests. And without intent and observation, it's just frequency. When being observed, the electrons would bounce off the barrier. When not observed, the electrons would act as waves and make it through the barrier, acting as a wave and as particle at the exact same time. When not observed, the electron would exist in two locations simultaneously, right? So a lot of different things going on there. And all this is, is us realizing the theories of a technology that we don't quite understand yet, but we're seeing occur when we have this whole UFO um, sighting situation going on around the world, right? So let's talk about the whole ATIP program for a second. 2004 to whenever they closed it down, I think it was 2017 or something like that. They had all these cases within the um, the UAP report, um, around 144 cases. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the the UFO report that was that just came out this past month that was asked to be released. Um, in the COVID relief bill that I think took place in November of last year, that they asked for the UFOs, the AT program to basically release all the information that they had in regards to this. There were two documents released. One was given to the Congress for the public, and that was for us, right? It was just a, a, 
less than 10 pieces of paper. And then there was a more in-depth one that was given to Congress that was classified. And in there, it was saying that these, um, and not only in there, but also other people that have come out and spoke about this that work for the program, have said that these craft were acting in a way that we know that we think is impossible, but we know isn't po is possible because we've been observing it through our um, experiments of quantum physics. So we've been experimenting the quantum physics and we've been seeing all of these amazing things happen. And now all of a sudden there are all these sightings that are doing the things that we are only theorizing is possible. That is what is the conventional thing right there. So when you see all these craft, it's not like, oh, they're doing something impossible. It's like, oh, they're doing something that we're actually realizing is possible, but we haven't really figured out how to do it yet. Well, that's what they're telling us. So what does this mean? A new form of space travel for humans. How are ETs coming to Earth, as I just explained? And the outdated theory that we are limited by the speed of light. The universe may actually be holographic in nature. Not only do these are we made out of subatomic particles, but it seems that these subatomic particles are vibrating in and out of reality, phasing in and out, just like a hologram, like just like a hologram does. And since we're phasing in and out of reality, we can only speculate that we are literally shifting in and out of reality always, but we only see ourselves as physically remaining here all the time. So not only that, we're also realizing that our whole ability to perceive how reality really is, is extremely limited compared to, you know, compared to what is actually out there and what we really are. Bilocation is occurring on the subatomic world. So on the subatomic world, a particle can exist in two locations simultaneously. What does that mean? Well, that's called bilocation. That's when, I don't know if anybody's ever made this joke before, but I have that like, I wish I could bilocate and duplicate myself so I can get more stuff done, right? And that bilocation is being in two places at once. And then I'm kidding around by saying like, I wish I was in two places at once so I could be doing twice the things that I'm doing. But we've actually achieved bilocation on the subatomic world. So all of these different components that could actually help shift our future and are truly paradigm shifting occurrences and technologies can come out, we've actually been able to manifest in the subatomic world and now, in order to do it on a larger scale, we need to figure out how we can bring that out into the larger scale world. Scale world. Just yesterday, I watched something on the Large Hydrogen Collider in CERN. And they were talking about how, in order to be able to create some similar occurrences on the Newtonian level, right, on the atomic level, that they would have to create a hydrogen collider the size of our solar system. Okay? So, firstly... That goes to show um, what kind of effort is needed in, with the technology that we're currently told we have in order to duplicate this on such a large scale, right? But then secondly, it also goes to show how limited and linear a technology has been because I feel I think that there's entire new technologies that can manifest from this where we're not going to need such um, to waste so much space in order to do so. And this is just the preliminary phases. We think that we're really advanced right now, but we're just at the beginning phases of a science that is going to completely shift the way we act on this planet, the way we live on this planet, the way we eat on this planet, the way we travel on this planet, everything. Just two hours ago, and if you're watching the replay on this, I guess it's more than two hours ago. Actually, no, it's like four hours ago. Uh, Virgin Galactic Richard Branson just went to space as the first citizen um, craft into space. Um, that just happened, right? In about a week, Jeff Bezos is doing it. Then Elon Musk is right after it. Not giving them any credit, um, giving them any credit for any, like they're doing what they're doing. I'm not saying that they're either good or bad. I'm just trying to tell you that we are now at a state where humans are publicly and openly going to be transported to space. We are in a universe that is life all over. There's UFOs and craft observing us. There are beings that are waiting for us to reach certain levels of technology and awareness so that we can start the interaction process. As humans start going out into space, and this is kind of a tangent, but it's still connected. As humans start going off into space and are able to perceive it for themselves, just like almost every astronaut that's been up there, they're going to see something. Not only do we have this technology here, not only is it being used by black budget programs, not only do we actually have UFOs and ETs interacting already doing it, but we've already taken citizens now to space. And this is all happening. A lot of space, this um, space awareness is happening in the last year to two years and into the next year or and a half from now. 
and then after that is a, is supposed to be the first man um, manned trip to Mars. Right. So we have technology that's beyond that, all that right now. And I got a feeling that we've been on Mars already. But what I'm showing you is what they're drip disclosing and what we're moving towards is only more of this technology coming out. And if we get to it, I'll show you the graph at the end of this that shows you the exponential increase of technology in our society and how it's inevitable that we're going to be reaching these heights in the near future. So there's also the double slit experiment here. Same, uh, same as before. <clears throat> Fundamental constitutions of matter. Electrons, protons, etc. can have two distinct states of existence, particle and wave form. So the particle representation of matter gives the impression that something exists at a particular point in space-time. So it actually exists within space-time. The wave representation asserts an uncertainty of location until the entity is observed. So if you're observing it, it becomes a particle that exists within this 3D, 3D construct or 4D construct that it actually exists within space-time. But if not, it's just a wave. And until you observe it, it doesn't manifest within this reality, this dimension. The more and more I research this, the more I realize it's, it's, it's directly related to exactly how computers um, operate and hard drives and data stored in that format. So my question is, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Well, if the tree is a subatomic tree, no, it doesn't, right? So on the subatomic world, if you're not observing it, technically it doesn't do that. So does the world we live in really exist, in quotations, when we aren't looking, or is it all just frequency all the time? Well, I would say both, right? As we can see here, that we exist as a particle and a wave at the same time, I would say we also both. And that leads me to the universal paradox. And if you watch any of my other presentations, you know how much I love talking about the paradox. And the whole concept is that the universe, multiverse, existence, dimensions, reality, all exist on a paradox. What is one of the most fundamental paradoxes? Well, we, we are made of subatomic particles, but we live in a Newtonian world, and Newtonian physics and subatomic physics contradict each other. Paradox. The universe is infinite, but also finite. Well, outside something, there's got to be something else. Outside one thing, everything needs to end. Well, if the universe is always expanding, that means it must be finite and it's expanding into infinity. But it's also already infinite. Paradox. Time exists, but it also doesn't exist. You know, new science has come out that time moves different speeds for everyone. When you go outside of our atmosphere, time is a completely different construct. Time is a linear construct between our distance between Earth and our sun. We even measure our time to get to other planets based on that construct, right? It is a construct for sure. And also, we've changed and manipulated our time so much, right, that it exists and it also doesn't. We are solid beings, yet we're also vibrating. Just like I showed you earlier, that you and I are subatomic particles waving frequencies, but we're also solid beings that we cannot pass through. Even though your vibration, technically I should be able to walk through you, right? You're just frequency. So the universe exists within, within a paradox. And so did... You know, this paradoxical reality in nature, I used to really try to contemplate and figure out what it meant. But the more I started exploring it, the more I realized it was about just accepting that paradox and moving forward because our brains are literally not entirely wired to accept the paradox. It, it, it kind of gets over on overdrive because a paradox means that they should not work together. It means it's paradoxical to us. But that just goes to show how limited our perception is because obviously that is how it is operating. But the fact that we can understand and accept that entirely goes to show that there must be some sort of frequency limitation within us to not understand that concept. Now we're transitioning here into dimensions. And there's just going to be two slides here to just break down kind of what dimensions are. And this is important as well because this connects to definitely extraterrestrial beings, um, you know, interdimensional beings, also other dimensions of Earth and what is a dimension and how they are created, right? So what are dimensions? The world, as we know it, has three dimensions of space. Length, width, depth, and one dimensional time, which is the fourth dimension. 
Physicists, mathematicians, and spiritualists believe in the possibility that many more dimensions do exist. According to string theory, the physical universe operates within 10 dimensions. That's what string theory believes. I, I believe that we exist within 12 dimensions, and then there's a 13th dimension, which is the void. But to be a little clearer about what we mean about dimensions is because there are a lot of different ways to, to use that term. It's used broadly. It's used for many overlapping and seemingly independent concepts. Parallel dimensions, physical and spiritual dimensions, dimensions in the galaxy, a realm of no dimension, the void, dimension within a dimension. So you can see here, all these are different kinds of concepts. Also, they probably overlap in many cases, but they're also called dimensions, right? Parallel dimension, many different versions of you, parallel infinite versions of you in different dimensions. Uh, physical dimensions, well, within this construct of this uh, matrix, if you will, or um, on this planet, there are multiple physical forms that you can exist within, within this planet. And maybe the planet also exists in those higher dimensions and you can physically live in those as well. Spiritual dimensions, realms of pure energy. So it's important to realize that these concepts and titles may have been spiritually informed, right, from ancient past, but are also human constructs based on our perception and unique experience on Earth. So the question is, why is this important? And I have this a few times within this entire presentation here, just to talk about, you know, what's the importance of what we're discovering right now? Quantum physics is the bridge that is needed to bring the sciences and spiritual tra traditions together. It is a science where all religion was derived, the subatomic world. You go to Buddhism, you go to ancient Vedic texts, they're talking about the subatomic particles. In Buddhism, there's a term called kalapas, kalapas. What does kalapas mean? It means subatomic world, right? So this is ancient wisdom. The universal language is mathematics, right? We've been taught, taught that since we were very young, I guess, because I was taught that when I was a child. And the mathematical intervals are the same for music. So the universal language is also music. So music and math have the same <laughs> mathematical intervals. So the universal language is also math, but it's also music. And mathematics, math is really the linear component of it all. And then we have the music, which is the creative, secular component of it. When we talk about science and frequency, we have to talk about Pythagoras and give him some credit. Most of us know who Pythagoras is. He was a Greek philosopher, was the father of music theory in the West. The Pythagoras Mystery School on the island of Cortana taught the use of flute and lyre as the primary healing instrument with his monochord. Pythagoras was able to unravel the mysteries of musical intervals. We know him as the father of geometry. If it wasn't for Pythagoras, many different equations that were needed in order to create society that was used over thousands of years, including by the stonemasons, would not have come into fruition. But Pythagoras, a little bit about his story, and I'm going to actually do a whole presentation at one point, uh, probably an hour to two hour presentation just on Pythagoras. But he went to Egypt for 10 years as well and was initiated into many different schools. He was provided with ancient events awareness from celestial beings. So in these mystery schools, the Egyptians were very open to outsiders actually coming in and Pythagoras, they welcomed him with open arms and initiated him into some teachings that even Egyptian citizens weren't even allowed to get. So he successfully connected geometry, mathematics to music the theory, thereby founding the Western musical scale. Pythagoras considered that music contributed greatly to health. He called his method musical medicine. To the accompaniment of Pythagoras, his followers would sing in unison certain chants at times, his disciplines, his disciples employed music as medicine with certain melodies composed to cure the passions of the psyche, anger, and aggression. And he was also, as I said, the founder of geometry. Just give me one moment here, guys. I'm just going to take a 30-second break just to grab some water. I'm going to be right back. All right. So Pythagoras, he didn't set out just to create geometry, right? All the things, all the linear sciences that came from Pythagoras, it doesn't seem like that was his initial intent. His initial intent was to figure out what kind of frequencies and melodies would help shift the human psyche, 
right? He was an experimenter in the realm of sound and vibration. But through that awareness and through that exploration, geometry came about. Pythagoras theorized that all things have frequency and even each planet has its own vibration. He called the sound that each of these bodies would make the music of the spheres. And here are some videos. I'm just going to play 30 seconds of each of these videos. And basically, Pythagoras is right. Each of these celestial bodies do make a sound and frequency. And as I said in the first couple of slides, the universe is singing. Well, now we're able to take technology and utilize it to see what frequencies are being emanated and translate that into sound. And that has been what has been done. And this is the sound of the moon right here. Sound Jupiter. Sometimes I use these sounds to meditate. Here is the sound of Saturn. expect the sound to be right. So the celestial bodies are making sounds, and so is the Earth, so are human beings, so are star beings, so are extraterrestrials. So spacecraft, right? We all have our own frequency and not all of those sounds are audible, especially since we can only perceive a certain Hertz vibrational frequency range when it comes to what we hear. As I was exploring through all this information, I came up with this kind of basic equation here. The universal language is quantum physics, right? Because it's a subatomic world. The subatomic world is really what makes everything up. So that equals the mathematics of vibration music frequency and sound of the universe. So quantum physics is really the mathematics of vibration and frequency of all that is. All right, so now we get into the whole extraterrestrial frequency um, connection. How does this relate? What does extraterrestrial and frequency have to do, right? I wrote an article uh, with each other. I wrote an article a few years ago saying what does UFOs, I think it was, what does extraterrestrials have to do with meditation? Or it might have been, what does extraterrestrials have to do with meditation? And my answer is, it was, you know, a long article, but the premise of it all was that it's a frequency game, right? What what shifts your frequency and vibration? What are some tools and modalities on the earth that help with that? What harmonizes your vibration to be at a harmonic frequency range where you're able to perceive extraterrestrial life? And that would be uh, modalities such as meditation. There's thousands of meditation types. Meditation isn't just sitting in one place. There's all types of ways that you can be meditative. There's even food. So that whole article was really talking about why spirituality, a spiritual community seem to be the ones that gravitate towards the UFO disclosure information the most, right? They're those that are into the nuts and bolts exclusively, but you'll see a lot of people into UFOs and ETs happen to go into the spiritual avenue. And why is that? And the answer is it's a spiritual, it's a frequency game. So why don't we see extraterrestrials around us everywhere, right? There are countless, at this point in my life, I believe there are countless extraterrestrials and interdimensional beings interacting with our reality all the time. Outside of planet, UFOs, spacecraft, so much going on. Um, and most of it we can't even perceive. We do not see them due to a vibratory shift of our or, or our collective frequency. Just recently, Neil deGrasse Tyson was on for a second time on Joe Rogan's podcast like two weeks ago. And he was asking, well, he was he was an unhealthy skeptic is Neil deGrasse Tyson, a very unhealthy skeptic because he's completely delusional to a lot of components. He was saying that, well, um, first of all, how would they get here, right? Going with the whole 
they can't travel in speed of light thing. And then he would say, why can't we see them? And why aren't they landing on the White House lawn? And why why is it that we don't have good pictures of them, images and all that stuff, right? Well, there's a very simple answer. It's a frequency game. There, We live in a world of vibration and frequencies. We're very limited in the range of frequencies we can perceive. These beings and starships vibrate at frequencies where they don't have to be seen by us, right? And unless they want to be. So the reason why is if we may have UFOs and craft everywhere, but we're not able to actually perceive them. Could be as simple as the fact that they don't want to be seen and they have technology that can shift out of vibrational frequency range so that we they can't be seen. And if you even look at whistleblower testimony, experiencers, channelers, that is what we kind of get. And that's the consensus is it is vibration of frequency. Extraterrestrials and interdimensionals often vibrate at frequencies that are not perceivable to all of our senses, but some of them, you know, some people hear things. That could be something as well, where you're able to utilize one sense in particular in order to tap into that frequency. In order to communicate and find extraterrestrial life in the universe, the mainstream uses radio waves. We send data through radio waves. You might think that radio waves might be an outdated form of communication since we have so many other types that have evolved since then. But the reason why we actually use radio waves to contact ETs is because they're one of the few frequencies that actually can pass through rock, like planets, debris, asteroids, and all those things, in, and space dust on the way. They don't get stopped by it. They can actually pass through it. So it's believed that if there's extraterrestrial life out there that are looking to see if there's any one out there as well, that they're probably going to utilize radio frequencies and pick those up because they know that that type of frequency is able to pass through all these celestial bodies. Radio waves are a form of electromagnetic radiation and thus they move at the speed of light. The speed of light is less than 300,000 kilometers per second. So, Radio waves also travel very fast, right, basically. So that's why they is used as well. It is assumed that extraterrestrial civilizations would be using these. Will we start seeing ETs in our lifetime? And it's important to say when we talk about ETs, we're talking about multiple things. There's interdimensionals, right, which means beings that are from different dimensions or dimensions between dimensions. And there's ultra-terrestrials. Ultra-terrestrials are beings that are on our planet that evolved past the conscious level that we are. And they still live on our planet. Maybe we can't perceive them. Maybe they're living under Earth in hollow Earth. So will we be able to see them in our lifetimes? Through, through my research, through the fact that I do what I do in Portal to Ascension and understanding the cycles of time, we are definitely shifting into another octave of existence. And when we shift from one octave to another octave, there is sometimes a lot of chaos, confusion, and disharmony before we actually have the full transition. So we're in that phase right now, shifting into it. Many cultures have prophesied the different time periods for this shift. So we're moving into a reality where the frequency on Earth will be less dense, allowing us to coexist with other realities, eventually allowing for a world where we have open contact, communication, interaction, and being able to see and perceive extraterrestrial, interdimensional, ultra-terrestrial life. It's in our future if we so choose to take the mission. And I feel that we're on the upward trajectory to get to that point. The science backs that this is um, potentially a reality that does exist. And the spiritual texts have been talking about this for thousands of years. So as these cycles are shifting and the veils thin, the veils are literally thinning so that we're able to reach these levels of consciousness at an easier rate. But before we do that, we have a lot of crap to go through and to experience or to just say transmute a lot of our past karma or whatever you might want to call it experiences, lessons that we haven't quite achieved yet or mastered. We're in that phase right now. And as we go through that phase, we can have the opportunity to create this world where we have this interaction with ET. And that's what I'm really like excited for. And partly one of the driving forces for what I do, like I would love to be in a world where we can have this open intergalactic community and just understand our nature and our purpose in the universe on a level that hasn't been taught to us. In the future, and we're in the closing, we're almost done here with this presentation. But I wanted to throw in a few different things that we're seeing that is quite possible 
quite possibly going to exist in our near future. And we've gone through some of them as we're doing this presentation. But one of them that um, I'm really intrigued to explore even more and see what manifests from it would be definitely be bilocation, which is a form of teleportation. Uh, bilocation is basically you being in two places at once. Teleportation is you transferring from one place into another place. Quantum position shows evidence that waves occupy multiple places in space at once, and we're all made out of waves, and has been demonstrated in small particles, subatomic world. As of 2019, scientists have been able to do the same thing with large chunks of physical matter. So this is, this is kind of breaking news, actually. This only happened two years ago. As I said earlier, that we were doing it on the subatomic world. Well, as of 2019, we're now able to do it with a bigger chunk of matter. So what we're seeing spacecraft do that are like huge motherships, we're able to do now with a chunk of physical matter. Physicists have scaled up their experiments demonstrating quantum superpositioning using larger and larger particles. Now, in a paper published September 23rd in 2019, an international team of researchers has caused molecule made up of 2,000 atoms to occupy two places at the same time. i got to read that again for you guys. An international team of researchers has caused a molecule made up of 2,000 atoms to occupy two places at the same time by location. The particle was 25,000 times the mass of a single hydrogen atom and is a start in the journey to discover how we can exist in two places at once. Some whistleblowers say advanced versions of this technology already exist. This makes sense in regards to the theory that there are multiple forms of self existing in parallel dimensions. Are we are we able to like create multiple versions of ourselves within this dimension? Because we already theorize that multiple versions of ourselves exist in parallel dimensions. Are we now uncovering the deepest intricacies of how dimensions exist and how we live in this reality. Now this video right here, I'm going to show you just really quick, is just another example of sound and vibration technology. And this one is a, a miniature version of a tractor beam, just like we see in, you know, Star Wars and other space shows and movies. And this is from 2016. So just imagine First of all, if this technology was taken black budget, what they've probably done with it, I'm sure that they have this on an advanced scale already, but these are the technologies that people are now discovering, the regular citizens of the world are, are able to manifest and create just because we're understanding the quantum world even more. I'm going to close off on these slides here, make sure. Yep. Okay. So this, what is it all about? What does the future hold for us? What can we possibly create in our future with using this technology and this understanding of the subatomic world and quantum physics? Well, we can definitely cure many, many illnesses and diseases on a wide level. We're understanding now that with frequency and vibration, we're able to put all types of things into remission. Technology to transport physical matter to other parts of Earth and space. So us able to go to another place within the universe without having to travel a linear distance to get there. Traveling faster than the speed of light, bending space time, reaching altered states of consciousness and gaining otherworldly experiences using frequency and body technology. Communicating with extraterrestrials, interdimensional beings. In, in my ancient history sound presentation, I show how maybe sound frequency was used in the Great Pyramid and in other ancient structures to possibly shift the consciousness of the individual to be able to communicate with the star beings. Transferring data instantaneously across the galaxy and the universe, which we're already doing on Earth through quantum computing. New advanced forms of transportation, harnessing energy from the vacuum. Major funding to these projects have been scarce until now. We could have free and sustainable energy. We can have conscious and intentional music using harmonic frequencies. 
we'll have a revolutionary understanding of our universe and the nature of reality. We can redefine how we conduct ourselves between nations and socioeconomically. We can cure poverty. Everybody can have a roof over the head, an intricate understanding of what it means to be human living within our physical bodies. So the applications are infinite. All things are sound of vibration. The when we understand that and realize that, we can even extend our lives using sound of frequency. But that would even go down to the the whole concept of if we create harmony within our bodies anyway, we could have a longer life. And then using frequency technology or harnessing modalities that utilize the subatomic world, meditative practices, we can actually extend our lifespans as well. So the future can be extremely beautiful and we can shift the world and really create peace in heaven on earth. And what I've been loving saying lately is like, we have the technology, the education, the know-how, the systems, all in place to create beautiful paradise on earth, but we haven't. The reason why is that a lot of these structures, old paradigm structures, from even from the Roman age 2,000 years ago, are still implemented in society and are on their way out. They're, they're no longer serving us, right? And they're not serving us in a way where they're actually inhibiting our progress at this point. So there's only a certain amount of time that we can go through that we are completely inhibited by progress because of these limitations that we've imposed on ourselves. So as we shift through those and move out of them, this these technologies will really shift the world. And when we look at money from a different a aspect, because a lot of these technologies aren't released because people want to milk every single product line and don't want to just give you the solutions and the answers, especially when it comes to frequency technology, healing illnesses and sicknesses. By giving this answer, they won't be able to make money on it. A great example is uh, part of part of the reason why UFOs haven't been disclosed at an earlier time would be also because many of these craft are not using petrol engines to get to the earth, right? As soon as we realize this is real and then we start asking the questions of how did they get here, many of the societal structures, organized religion, um, the oil industry, the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, all of these organizations that have a chokehold on the planet are going to have to eventually phase out. In the near future, we will see a complete terraforming of our planet if we continue down the trajectory we are on. It is inevitable. Special interests, corporations, and corrupt governments would have to stay in a reality that they can't that they can control. However, the science does not lie, and with so many independent inventions and discoveries, it's only a matter of time. It's time to fund these technologies and reroute the money into creating a sustainable future. And that is it. I'm just going to do this last graph here just to show you. So this graph is the trajectory of our technology since the 1400s. And you can kind of just see here how we went exponential, right? And if you just follow this graph, like when we hit just actually before like 1950, I guess, between 1900 and 1950 is really when we went exponential. And now we're just like skyrocketing and we're not stopping. So the more we're understanding, the more we're discovering, the more we're just accelerating into the future. So this graph right here and all the information that I've shared with you really makes me hopeful for a, an amazing world that we can really create, that we're going to have technology and understanding of ourselves and the nature of reality that we can't even fathom in this moment. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, everybody. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, everybody. This is it for today. This is Neil with Portal to Ascension. Please do subscribe to the channel if you are compelled to. Love you all. Hope you enjoyed it. The replay will be available immediately. Okay, take care. Good night, everyone.